unconference session two. Uh, this will be a roughly 12 minute day talk with the time for a few questions, but uh, given the fact the session is 40 minutes long, uh, if we do end early, I would maybe suggest going back through to the other room. Uh, from the onset of thinking about this uh, conference, I was very, very keen to get a session on preprints. And over the coming months, I tried three times to get a very sort of a high profile uh, preprint uh, speaker. All were keen to come, but uh, uh, all of them couldn't come on this particular day. So I thought I'll just do a quick uh, short talk myself. I have no clicker, so I need to. Uh, I probably don't need to include this. I've been using this uh, slide for many years. I call it the Cameron Nailing slide, but it essentially everything is uh, Creative Commons CCBY. Uh, but that sort of goes as red uh, these days. As I said, uh, no TARDIS uh, sound effect today. Uh, hands up, do you know what a preprint is, don't you? Excellent. That's more than I thought. My talk has been concluded. <laughs> uh, that's a definition from uh, Wikipedia. Uh, I've put uh, a caveat of your mileage may vary. The reason for that is... Uh, this is a recent paper from Cameron Nealon, Damon, Damon Patterson, Jeff Builder, Jennifer Lynn. Uh, this was a touch upon earlier. The, the, there may never be a universal definition of a preprint, but for the purposes of this talk, uh, I want to just uh, stick with that. So, uh, when I was uh, researching this talk, I was thinking, I thought I knew roughly how far back preprints uh, went, but after a bit of discussion on Twitter, yeah, I thought the answer was in the, the 1990s, but this is a, a recent uh, paper about five years ago, but it references uh, this uh, paper, which uh, includes a preprint from 1922. Now, obviously, at that time, preprints would be shared by, I can only assume, post, and so that's basically how far back preprints go, so hence it's, this is a, a journey in time, so we're kind of starting there. Eh... Uh, Things were going along fairly smoothly, uh, but with regards to preprints as an entity, uh, there was some uh, fight back over the years. In 1966, preprints were outlawed. Uh, this is a group of uh, researchers at the National Institutes for Health that were openly sharing uh, research by means of their preprints. And then there was uh, six uh, journals in question, by one of them being a uh, Nature Publishing Group. Uh, wanted to take lethal steps against the sharing of preprints. Which kind of ties in with, uh, I think, an entity called the Inglefinger Rule, which we'll come back to later on. Uh, I'm not going to read that, you can read it for yourself. It's not a very widely known about phenomenon, but it does still exist to this day. I say we'll come back to Mr. Inglefinger later. So that was the 60s. In terms of technology, sharing information, this is nothing to do with preprints, but they just generally sharing information from the 1960s, 70s, we're now going through to the, the next day, few decades. There was something major happened in terms of being able to share information. Can you think what it is? Net. Sorry? Net. Close. A certain web developer. Came onto the scene round about that time. Uh, two years later at uh, CERN, that's the, uh, another reference of uh, preprints, uh, having a database set up, preprints being shared, although it was pointed out to me a few weeks ago by Archive that uh, Aspire's entity is a database as opposed to Archive, which is a repository, but that's a small detail. Also the same year, thanks to Paul Ginsberg on the left, next to David Whitman, X N I H, good friend of mine. Uh, the archive was set up. It passed uh, a million papers uh, around about three or four years ago, but it's now 1.2. As you can see, it covers things like uh, physics, mathematics, computer science, etc. Uh, as matter stands, you can see the continued growth of submissions to archive. Same as uh, most other archives, these aren't peer reviewed, but they're screened to make sure it's not complete bullshit, and believe me, bullshit doesn't set. Uh, the first one that I became aware of after that was thanks to uh, Nature, the NPG, where previously they were outlawing, but then started to dabble again. That, that's where my first 
preprint got to postings, they not published as they were careful to point out to me. That was disbanded in 2012, but so we're back to 2007. And the bad guys return again. Inglefinger. It was starting to really annoy me. And a few others, and they can't be nailing, came up with the expression, give the finger to Inglefinger. As you do, you create t-shirts and you buy it. More importantly, uh, this uh, link here is a Google Doc by myself and uh, Scott Evans from Gigasites, uh, creating a database of publishers and uh, journals that still practice Inglefinger to this day. When you consider there's roughly 34,500 STM journals in the world at present, from that uh, database there's only 37 still practice Inglefinger, but some of them are quite significant in terms of a publisher such, such as the, the Glamour Mag SL. Uh, 2013 was the launch of Bell Archive, and that's a fairly recent uh, data set of the number of submissions uh, there, but the same as Archive is on the growth, there's no question of it. And then, just to mention the scope of uh, what is accepted at the Bioarchive. And then we have an explosion since then. This uh, slide in the next, is, is this, these are the same data. But it's, as you can see, again, growth, Finch here, preprints.org, proceedings we've mentioned, Winnower, F1000, research, peer G preprints, and so on. But uh, the same data, displayed differently, you can quite clearly see that uh, 2013 was the, the boom era. Uh, yes. uh, 2013 was a five million dollar entity called a uh, Centre for Open Science or Open Science Framework. They operate about four key activities, but the uh, preprints is uh, one of them. So we're starting to have central places to have all these uh, preprints. This is one of them. Uh, recently, just over uh, two million that are all in this one shop. And I'm a big fan of Wikipedia, and this is the state of the preprint page on Wikipedia earlier on this year, but they're trying to keep on top of all the new XIVs. It was not difficult, but well, it was kind of I have edited that page about 60 times. But thankfully, Wikipedia's crowdsource is not just me. Again, you can see chemistry, engineering, social sciences, psychology, Agriculture, paleontology, sport, law, the list is almost endless. That's the state of the Wikipedia page now. It's been somebody came in and they better structured it. So that this looks much better to me. A 2005 launch of a, a movement in America, ASAP Bio, that's mainly done by Jessica Polka, who's in charge of that. Lots of their meetings all about preprints. That's one from about a year ago, Heather Joseph from Spark. There's other key players involved in this entity, such as uh, Harold Varmus, who's the head of the NIH, who's all for preprints. Uh, from earlier this year, Facebook Zuckerberg got involved as part of his big, sorry, their big $3 billion mission to cure all diseases. But in terms of how much money was pumped into by archive, we don't know, but you're looking at around about a million dollars. This applies to everything in life. Looking at this from three perspectives, I touched upon this uh, briefly in the earlier unconference session. In terms of uh, how much uh, things cost, this is a, these are data, thanks to Stuart Lawson and others. Uh, some really good uh, data vis uh, tool which I would encourage you to play with, but this is how much uh, Scottish universities pay to get access to research. When I stay there's an APC van appears quite often, but it's not to do with article processing charges. Uh, but in terms of open access, again, there are costs involved. 
67% of open access journals don't charge a fee, but for the ones that do, uh, the best average I can find is by Solomon et al, 906 dollars. Uh, how much do you think it, to post a preprint doesn't cost anything? Uh, but there is web hosting, etc. Any wild ideas as to how much a preprint costs? Any stab it? No? 10 bucks. Although it could actually be lower than that, but compared to the other figures, it's kind of cheap. Again, it's not been peer reviewed. That's an important thing to mention as a caveat. If you want to post a preprint, you need to check with your journal or publisher. The best place that I'm aware of is it's Sharp and Romeo. Nothing to do with basic chat, I just wanted to put them. <laughs> uh, but it's usually extremely clear as to what you can and can't do. It's always better to check as to what you're allowed to do, otherwise you'll get a takedown notice, etc. If you want some of these, They usually send five by post. You just uh, go to that link at the bottom and spend a few weeks, you'll get a few stickers if you want some. Uh, thanks to Centre of Open Science, about uh, two months ago, we created a Twitter list of who to follow if you're interested in preprints. It's so actually the second link. Uh, preprint and Explorers, I think there's around about 40 in that feed, but it's worth having a look at if you're into Twitter and preprints. Some further reading, if you're again wanting more information on preprints. And that's me. I did see it, you short. Thank you.